Greenwood. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Well, before ha us, we have a very large omnibus bill, uh, with packed with seven very distinct schedules. And I would say it's a bad habit uh, that the minister has of putting together very disparate issues, um, and ultimately then means you avoid scrutiny on those individual schedules and uh, parts. The three of the seven schedules, three key areas that I will speak to today, and that is in relation to first the bill to rent incentive although I'm not necessarily confident that Warringah residents will see benefits from these incentives with more affordable housing. They are nonetheless very important. Secondly, it legislates a $20,000 instant asset write-off for small businesses for the new financial year starting on July, even though it should be noted that the write-off promise for this current financial year has not been legislated um, and is urgently needed to be done because it really uh, misleads ultimately small businesses in thinking they had an asset write-off available to them. Um, also, the, sc the scope of that asset write-off at $20,000 is, I would argue not sufficient. Thirdly, the other schedule will be the buy now, pay later operators, who will finally be better regulated under the Credit Act. This will help ensure and stem the tide of abuse that some partners or spouses, for example, use uh, through these operators for a form of, it is a form of family and domestic violence where debts are racked up on behalf of, of partners. Um, it is also an area where people are unknowingly accumulating huge amounts of debt that have a serious impact uh, on their capacity to meet the costs of living in other areas. So, on that schedule in relation to the build to rent, we desperately need more houses in the country. There is no doubt. It is very much an issue topical in every corner of the country. I continue to get a huge amount of correspondence from constituents in Moringa worried about housing. It's a generational thing as well, where young people, having grown up in the area, simply face completely unaffordable situation to stay anywhere near where they grew up. Uh, I'll be hosting a forum on this in a few months because, of course, it is incredibly complex to solve this problem of having more uh, housing supply uh, but also having it uh, being affordable. In Moringa, uh, we have some of the highest property uh, price increases when it comes to purchase of property, but also some of the most expensive rents in the country. We know there is a, a significant amount of housing stress and it is incredibly difficult because we are also bound from having an ocean on much of our coastline, and we do not have the public transport infrastructure necessary to go into any kind of higher density um, uh, building for in our area. Uh, we know housing uh, and, and cost of living stress is biting, especially with those high rents. Uh, one of our local charities, One Mill Northern Beaches, is providing record numbers of meals to those facing food insecurity as a result of uh, soaring uh, rental costs and energy costs uh, and many other aspects. And so we know households, young people are under stress. They are incredibly burdened with hex debts and other areas of, of debt. And so we, we simply must be doing more. Uh, as I've said a number of times, every tool should be and every lever needs to be looked at to um, alleviate this house the house, housing crisis that we're currently in. Uh, it is, make no mistake, a result of years and years of policy that have incentivised uh, from both sides of government for housing to be viewed uh, as an investment strategy. But unfortunately with that has come now a situation of housing supply and housing affordability that has not kept up with the population. Uh, we need systematic reform. Uh, or it will get very much worse. Um, I do agree that we must have policies from government that ensure that housing is available to everyone in our society. The government has committed through this bill and the schedule to build 1.2 million houses by the end of the decade and reducing the acute shortage of new rental stock is absolutely fundamental to achieving this. The government has been unveiling several new in initiatives to help tackle the crisis. And this bill provides another piece of the puzzle, a build to, build to rent tax incentives. These provisions will go some way to alleviate the lack of supply of rental properties, at least in some parts of the country. 
Some aspects of this bill are encouraging, including the eligibility criteria. That is, that a minimum number of dwellings of 50 or more and, a minim and minimum lease terms are required to be for three or more years. These build-to-rent developments must be held under single ownership for a minimum of 15 years, providing stability and certainty to renters, uh, something very few renters experience in the market currently. It should be clear that the current build-to-rent market in Australia is basically at a standing start. It just hasn't had focus. It makes up a tiny 0.2 per cent of the current housing market. Comparative to other countries, we're just way behind. Uh, in the UK, it's at 5% of uh, investment, and in the US, it's at 12% of housing supply. So there, the model has helped expand housing supply. In Australia, the build-to-rent market has to date been focused more on the higher end of the market, uh, and it's, it is encouraging that this bill intends to increase rental supply more broadly, including in the affordable housing area, with a requirement for 10 per cent of the dwellings to be tenanted on an affordable basis. Of course, the question of affordable basis is very dependent on regions and ge geography, and that is where the difficulty for Warringah is uh, we have some of the highest rents in the country, and so that affordable basis is unlikely to be of much assistance here. Core logic data shows renters in Moringa are paying a median rent of over $1,100 per week, compared to $627 per week across Australia. Affordable housing is defined as the rent payable being set at 74.9 per cent um, in, uh, in a, of rent payable in a comparable dwelling in an open market. Given these astronomical rent levels in Moringa, 74.9 per cent of rent may still not be affordable by people on lower incomes and especially frontline service workers um, and essential service workers that we are ultimately trying to incentivise with this scheme. Um, and so it is difficult to see or I, I'm concerned that they are likely not to get that benefit in Moringa. So I would encourage the government to start showing more precision in its policy making in housing um, and uh, to do more when it comes to um, other areas. For example, uh, this legislation is cons and other legislation from the government are consistently silent on housing initiatives when it comes and building standards. So if we're going to be putting public money and tax incentives towards these kind of projects, um, I urgently would ask for the government to consider that right around the country we must take into account climate resilience in everything we build, everything we are paying for, everything we are incentivising must be climate resilient or we will have a situation where it will be short-term supply that will be at risk and then we will have public money needing to come in because of emergency funding when disasters strike. We know housing is a wicked policy area. The government talks up the big numbers that they have been investing, but I think there needs to be a reality check on how much will actually be delivered when it comes to some of the building uh, projects and the supply. The government needs to remember places such uh, as Warringah, higher socioeconomic as well as others, have a variety of need for housing and the cookie cutter solutions won't always work during this crisis. Things like going back to thinking about borders, of having rooms for rent within homes, having uh, tax incentives or a policy a taxonomy that incentivises, for example, granny flats, and those kind of things can also assist in supply. So I would urge the government to think outside the square and have more solutions on the table. Another schedule in this legislation is a small business asset, asset, uh, instant asset write-off. Now, this one, I have to say, it's, it, it's a little bit... Uh, it's interesting. We now have it back on the table. It was announced in the budget again uh, for, the, for it to be for this next financial year. Ironically, a year ago, we had the same announcement in the budget. That asset write-off was there and promised to small businesses, um, but that legislation hasn't passed in this financial year. And so if a business did a purchase hoping to be able to rely on that measure, um, it's essentially got a couple of weeks to... Uh, it's run out of time, essentially. And so it's been quite disappointing to see there has been political gains on this, where the government has refused to negotiate or put anything more on the table. 
the, um, and on the other hand, we have seen the Coalition and the Greens uh, move for it to be amended, which obviously has budgeting uh, issues as well. I support that it be increased. We know small businesses are suffering enormously. High interest rates, high and rising insurance costs. I should note the highest inflationary item for small businesses and households is, in fact, those rise of insurance premiums, high energy prices, staff shortages, low consumer confidence. There is a, just a perfect storm. Small businesses are the backbone of our economy. They make up 97.3 per cent of businesses in Australia. In, in Warringah, we have a vibrant hub of economic activity where over 8,000 small businesses uh, employ many people and some 12,000 sole traders. My office and volunteers recently undertook a survey of small businesses in the electorate. And whilst it's not finished yet, there's some clear issues that come out. And those are around taxation, cash flow, inflation, red tape and government regulation, particularly um, there seems to be so much, uh, uh, well, the IR changes have certainly made it more difficult for small businesses. Um, and of course, everything going up, including rent, utilities, insurance and wages. Uh, recruiting and keeping qualified staff is an issue. And right now, 43% of small businesses are not breaking even. And so this should be at the forefront of the government's focus. COSBOA in March this year reported that 1,000 businesses became insolvent, the worst on record since 2015. Th approximately three in four business owners are taking home less than the average minimum wage. Because what happens in small businesses is usually it's a business owner works in that business and ultimately does not take back that wage for themselves. So organisations like COSBOA are reporting and advocating on their behalf. Um, that really more needs to be done by the government to support small businesses. So these relief, this relief measure, whilst I welcome it, I am concerned that it wasn't available in this financial year and we need to do more. The is instant asset write-off is undoubtedly a useful tool for enhancing small business cash flow and encouraging investment. The feedback is generally positive. Small businesses in Moringa have expressed concerns, though. Um, the temporary nature of the provision makes long-term business planning incredibly difficult, and I think this should be made more permanent with a larger fixed amount to provide certainty and stability for small businesses. We absolutely need to support small businesses to electrify and to get to energy efficiency and savings. We need to help them decarbonise because they can make a huge difference on their way as well. Uh, inclusion of the energy incentive, again, could have further assisted small businesses by buying heat pumps, cooling systems, batteries, more efficient appliances like fridges, their lighting. So many areas can and should be made uh, better for them. Finally, buy now, pay later. I welcome that this is finally going to be regulated as a form of credit. Until now, these services have largely been unregulated and they have caused harm amongst our most vulnerable. In particular, uh, and it's quite frightening, these services have caused harm amongst those suffering from family and domestic violence. Good Shepherd, a provider of family violence and financial wellbeing services, have said that perpetrators perpetrators may coerce women to sign up for a buy now pay later account or fraudulently use their personal details to accrue debts through buy now pay later. Equally, victim survivors may be forced to turn to buy now pay later services to access when their access to their money or ability to cover living expenses is controlled or restricted by an abusive partner. In 2022, in fact, the University of Sydney study found um, that uh, financial abuse was suffered by one participant from a former partner who had accrued some $9,000 in debt uh, with a 12 uh, buy now, pay later services. And she told the study, I had a poor credit rating, but I was still approved for, for every provider. I missed so many payments and never received any assistance, just fees. So it is incredibly important to now bring that form of purchasing into more regulated credit, uh, similar to credit uh, regulation. We know uh, there's a uh, there is a, still a, a, an issue with uh, this current uh, format of legislation. Um, there's an assumption that debts of under $2,000 are okay or assumed to carry lower risk of harm. 
but the legislation could better protect people by limiting that $2,000 further. We know we have to combat financial abuse, and this is a complex area.